I've recently read that Africa is the, um, is the most targeted region in the world as far as sanctions uh, are concerned. And the sources of those sanctions are sort of varied. They come from the United Nations in terms of Chapter 7 measures taken. They come from individual states and they come from regional blocs like the European Union, but also from the African Union itself. Uh, which has taken on a new role at this point in time, and I will um, allude you to some of the developments, albeit briefly in that regard. So I think it uh, could be a quite an interesting case study uh, to see what is going on, um, not only inside individual African countries, but also as far as the regional uh, bodies are concerned. I want to start to say that I'm extremely grateful for this opportunity, and especially for the... Um, uh, the rather sophisticated explanations that Charlotte uh, sent to all of us for preparing for this event and also for the, the second phase of, of the project. Uh, I think that sort of explanation speaks of um, a thorough understanding of the issues that we are dealing with at the moment and how to address it. And that was very helpful. But having said that, um, Madam Chair, I'm afraid that as far as South Africa's position is concerned and its practice, there is little sophistication involved. And the reason why I say so is because the country's position suggests a rather blunt approach to the issue of unilateral and or extraterritorial um, sanctions. Uh, in the sense that the use of sanctions, according to South Africa's view, as an enforcement mechanism in international law is a multilateral issue that must be addressed within the collective security framework of the United Nations Charter on the Chapter 7. In order to explain this to you today, I'm going to concentrate on mainly three issues. First of all, South Africa's membership of the non-aligned movement, which plays a significant role in the external relations of the country. The African Union approach, uh, I will also allude to very briefly, because also South Africa's membership of the African Union and the influence that comes from the Union itself as far as the conduct of individual members is concerned. And then thirdly, I would like to give you a broad overview of South Africa's uh, legislative developments on the issue of sanctions which will confirm the position that I just explained to you, namely that South Africa sees the enforcement of sanctions as a, as a collective security issue. And then right at the end I would like to make a very brief remark about the impact of all of this on uh, the financial industry like banks, uh, in view of a study a colleague and myself have undertaken recently. I'm not going to dwell on that a lot because I see it's on the program for tomorrow. <coughs> And I'm really looking forward um, to um, our Latvian colleague who will speak on that. So I'm very interested in, in those developments as well. Now let's start with the non-aligned movement. Uh, South Africa, as I've said, is a, is a member of the non-aligned movement. Currently, as you probably know, the movement has 123 members and it forms a significant block within the General Assembly in terms of decision making and what comes out of the General Assembly. South Africa has aligned itself with a movement stance on unilateral coercive sanctions, uh, which uh, is a topic that has been addressed by the non-aligned movement for many, many years now. I'm only going to refer you to two recent examples, which confirms the historical position of the non-aligned movement. In its 2017 political declaration of New York, the movement has reaffirmed, and I'm going to quote, its determination to refrain from recognizing, adopting, or implementing extraterritorial or unilateral coercive measures or laws, including unilateral economic sanctions." Unquote. In the same style and manner, the movement recorded its condemnation, that is the word used, of such measures and called for their immediate elimination. Secondly, at its 18th summit, which took place in Baku in October of this year, the movement again, and I quote from the document, strongly condemned the unilateral application of economic and trade measures and in agreement with its members 
to refrain from recognizing, adopting or implementing extraterritorial or unilateral coercive measures. Now, as far as that is concerned, when the annual resolution for ending the US embargo against Cuba served again in the 2018 session of the General Assembly, South Africa supported the call by the non-aligned movement, as well as the Group of 77 and the African Group in the Assembly, to end the unilateral economic, commercial and financial blockade against Cuba and requested the US to reconsider its policies against Cuba. And that has been the stance of the South African government since the new government took power in 1994 after the new de uh, democratic elections at the time. Secondly, the African Union. Uh, another indication of South Africa's stance on the issue of sanctions in general can be inferred from the so-called Isolwini Consensus of 2005 adopted by the African Union, which constitutes the Union's common position on the reform of the United Nations in response to the 2004 high-level panel on threats, pan uh, challenges and change of which you are familiar with, one of the seminal documents that came out in recent times in the United Nations. In response to this report, recommendations on improving the effective implementation of and compliance with UN sanctions, the Israel winning, winning consensus had the following to say, and I quote from the document. The power of the Security Council to impose sanctions should be exercised in accordance with the United Nations Charter and international law. Sanctions should be considered only after all means of peaceful settlement of disputes on the Chapter 6 of the UN Charter have been exhausted and a thorough consideration on the taken of the long-term and long-term effects of such sanctions. Further, sanctions should be imposed for a specific time frame and be based on tenable legal grounds and should be lifted as soon as objectives are achieved. Stand sanctions should only be smart and targeted to mitigate the humanitarian efforts." Unquote. Now, while the OAU, the predecessor of the African Union, found the imposition of sanctions against member states problematic to justify, in view of the organization's ardent adherence to the principles of territorial integrity and non-interference in domestic affairs of member states, the African Union showed a greater willingness to sanction member states for not adhering to the AEU's constitutive instruments. By far the most sanctioned, be sanctioned behavior are unconstitutional changes of government, which has the effect that the governments who came to power in this manner are interdicted from participating in the activities of the AEU. The governments are interdicted. This membership of the state is not suspended. It's a difference between the two. And secondly, that individual <coughs> members of that government may be subjected to targeted sanctions. Now, such members, uh, sorry, such men measures were imposed by the African Union in respect of the Central African Republic, Togo, Mauritania, Guinea, Niger, Madagascar, and Cote d'Ivoire. Until very recently, and I think there's now a new range of states who face sanctions in this regard. Now, there's some kind of an irony involved in the, um, the activities of the African Union as far as sanctions are concerned. And I want to take you back a few years when my country faced um, a very extensive uh, sanctions regime imposed uh, by the United Nations as, uh, as a result of South Africa's racial policies and the apartheid system. Now, one of the consequences of that sanctions regime, um, based on, on, on the UN efforts, uh, was that many of the African countries, especially those surrounding South Africa, could not implement uh, those sanctions because of their uh, weak position economically and politically at the time. And they all had to request, not all, but many of them had to request assistance from the United Nations on Article 50 of the UN Charter. Now, current um, announcements made by the African Union 
has suggested um, that, again, even under the African Union imposed sanctions, many African countries find it difficult to effectively implement those sanctions, which is actually a great irony because, once again, the regional body is faced with this reality and it has announced itself that apart from the fact that its member states uh, do not have the ability to effectively enforce the sanctions, the African Union itself has no experience uh, with the imposition of sanctions. The consequence of that is that it is extremely difficult to establish at this point in time whether these sanctions uh, imposed regionally have any effect uh, in the areas uh, where you know, people are, or entities are targeted. Um, and the information is also not available. The third issue I promise to give some indication of uh, is the legislative framework South Africa adopted um, over the last uh, decade or more, two decades, uh, concerning sanctions. Now, the practice here established, uh, you will note, is once again that uh, the legislative practice is to enforce the position that uh, South Africa will uh, make an effort to implement sanctions once they originate from the, uh, from the Security Council decision on the Chapter 7. Now, the first occasion arose in the early 1990s. That was shortly before the democratic elections in South Africa in 1994 when by virtue of several resolutions, the Security Council imposed mandatory sanctions against the former Yugoslavia. This occurred, as I've said, shortly before the landmark 1994 elections, um, and the only enabling law at the time for the enforcement of UN sanctions regime against Yugoslavia was the Import and Export Control Act of 1963, which empowered the Minister of Trade and Industry to restrict the importation or exportation of certain goods to and from South Africa whenever deemed necessary or expedient in the public interest. That was the objective they wanted to protect. Now it is doubtful whether the nature and scope of this law even remotely complied with the Security Council had in mind at the time. And this was also sensed by the then Minister of Foreign Affairs uh, I think he was acutely aware at the time of the shortcomings of this act. Um, as a result of that uh, assessment, uh, literally uh, just before the, the elections took place in 1994, uh, the minister in question explained in Parliament the need for new legislation aimed at the enforcement of Security Council resolutions. And giving a reason for that need, he said that South Africa should take uh, note of unfolding developments in the world and the issues that will dominate the international stage in the period that lies ahead. Those were quite prophetic words. Now, following this in the intervention, Parliament adopted uh, at the time an act for the implementation of uh, United Nations sanctions. This was Act 172 of 1993. Now, the great irony is, is this act was never given force and effect until today. So it has never become operational, which created a, a sort of problem concerning the legal basis for government when government decides to give effect to United Nations sanctions because of the principle of legality. Uh, there was no legal authority to do so. However, subsequent developments I think have overtaken the relevance of that attempt to put in force the new legislation. Because of the fact that uh, two pieces of legislation adopted in 2001 and 2004 respectively uh, came into force in effect. The 2001 Act is called the Financial Intelligence Center Act 38 of 2001 which is a, a piece of legislation for the combating of money laundering activities and the financing of terrorist and related activities. Although this act was initially aimed to enable South Africa to comply with the Financial Action Task Force recommendations, a subsequent am amendment to this act in 2017 
caused Section 3 of the Act to clearly list as one of its objectives the implementation of financial sanctions pursuant to resolutions adopted by the United Nations Security Council. This amendment was necessitated by the Act's alignment with the 2004 Act I mentioned, and which was simply the Act to give effect to uh, counter-terrorism measures uh, imposed by the, by the Security Council, and that was Act 33 of 2004. Now, by virtue of Section 25, the Act provides for the proclamation in the Government Gazette of Security Council imposed counter-terrorism measures adopted under Chapter 7 of the UN Charter. And the proclamation made in terms of the section enables the Parliament to consider it and decide on the action to be taken. So this is the Act that we needed already back in, um, uh, in 1994 with the sanctions against um, uh, Yugoslavia. So this constitutes the sum total uh, of South Africa's regulatory framework for the enforcement of sanctions. In the unlikely event, and I think it's most unlikely, that South Africa decides to supplement United Nations sanctions with its own unilateral sanctions regime, legislative measures for that purpose will have to be adopted to comply with the principle of legality in the Constitution. But as I've said, uh, so the result of South Africa's alignment with what the non-aligned movement um, imposes and with the African Union stance, that is not likely to happen, uh, with the, uh, which enforces the position that South Africa remains with the orthodox position, sanctions belongs uh, under the auspices of the Security Council. Now let me conclude um, with a few remarks. Now, from the perspective of the state, the opposition to the adoption and implementation of unilateral and extraterritorial sanctions operates at the level of international law and international relations. Entirely different is the position of non-state entities within such states, when such entities are essential partners in the interconnected world of financial transactions. They cannot easily escape the transactional consequences that emanate from the imposition of sanctions by political entities, with the result that they operate in a far more precarious environment. Recently, a colleague specializing in banking law and myself completed a study on the impact of U.S. unilateral sanctions under the OPEC system on financial transactions in the shipping industry. Targeted sanctions relating to ships impact upon international sales mainly in two ways. Firstly, they may affect directly the free movement of ships by denying them access to particular harbors, being refueled or from trans-shipping goods on board, as well as subjecting the ship and its cargo to seizure and asset freezes. Secondly, they may impact indirectly by preventing financial institutions this is the point I want to make, from processing payments in respect of transactions involving a targeted ship. In the case of U.S. sanctions, banks in other countries, including my own, which as a cold legal fact may not technically be bound by the U.S. legislation in this regard, will mostly also refuse to process, process or make a payment on the basis of a strong business and reputational consideration. The impact of sanctions on the ability of banks to make payment in international sale transactions is particularly evident in the letter of credit practice, the dominant method of payment when security of payment becomes a real concern. The letter of credit has developed over the past century into a remarkably secure instrument, ensuring not only that the seller is paid but also that the buyer receives the goods contracted for. As a result, targeted financial sanctions and security of payment in international sales, to put, put it mildly, experience a very difficult coexistence. Thank you.